Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Mark Boyle. I represent Chadwick Paddock. If the court will indulge me, this is an exercise. I know we've got some students here. This is an exercise. It's my favorite exercise as a lawyer. But the last time I said that in front of a group of students, Judge Catherine Wave gave me the worst, admittedly polite, professional oral argument blistering I had ever taken. We'll try to be kind to you today. There was no lack of kindness. I got what I deserved in that case. It still resulted in an affirmance for my client. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. This is an appeal from a declaratory summary judgment in an automobile coverage case. The coverage dispute arises from a judgment my client, Mr. Paddock, obtained against Yuri Jimenez, who we refer to, and I'll probably refer to in this oral argument as the driver, of a vehicle that was insured by Kingsway Amigo. They were actually known as U.S. Security at the time. And that vehicle was owned by her uncle, Mr. Delgado. Mr. Paddock filed this case originally based on his status as a third-party creditor, which Florida law allows, and then later amended the claim to include an assigned claim related to Ms. Jimenez. But he actually got an assignment? No, what we actually did was we... You got an execution on it. That's right. We executed on his chosen action, and the court assigned us the claim. I've never seen that before, to be honest with you. I've done it a few times, Judge. And there's some... That isn't the issue on appeal, but there's some support for that in the older cases that predate the non-joinder statute. The case proceeded to summary judgment, and the judge signed just a generic order not setting forth... Judge Hayes, and I'm not criticizing him for this, set forth just a generic order granting the summary judgment request of the insurer. I wanted to focus on what I think is the simplest argument for reversal because it washes away all of the other arguments, if we're right about it, and it's the estoppel argument. So Florida recognizes... I think I conceded in my brief, general rule number one, Florida doesn't recognize coverage by estoppel as a general proposition, but there's two big exceptions, one of which is relevant here and one of which is not. The first one is there's a general species of equitable estoppel, some of which has been codified in the claims administration statute in terms of whether you have to have detrimental reliance that disallows in certain circumstances carriers from relying on conditions in their policies. Usually we think of that as late notice cooperation. That's not applicable here. We're not trying to seek coverage. They're not trying to deny the claim based on a forfeiture grounds, and we're not trying to seek coverage. There's a subset of equitable estoppel that's been recognized by the Florida Supreme Court in most recently a case called Doe v. Allstate that allows coverage to be afforded to a party where it might not otherwise be present as long as all the elements of promissory estoppel are present. There's not really much dispute in this case that at least most of the... that all of the elements but one were at least potentially present based on the record. What are those elements? They take a... Under the Doe v. Allstate formation, in terms of the elements, it's the exact same fact as our case. An insurer begins the defense of an insured without having reserved their rights. The case is not specific about whether they had to know or not know about it, but we don't need to overcome that in this case because we know that within 30 hours of the accident, the owner had given an examination under oath and told the carrier that at least from his perspective, the driver didn't have permission. So the carrier initiates a defense in handling of this case, which included both the attempt to negotiate a settlement, which failed based on a demand from the plaintiff, and they continued to defend the insured until about three months before trial. So for over 900 days, even though the carrier knew that there was a potential, or should have known, there was a potential defense based on her lack of permissive use, they defended her. And initially, they did so with one attorney. They eventually recognized enough that there was a conflict between the two attorneys to separate that, but still didn't issue a reservation of rights. So they had a separate lawyer for her during this trial? Correct. At the trial stage, in about... 
And you, you it was about, it was about three months into the litigation. As an insured, but I mean, the, the coverage issue here is that she probably isn't a resident, albeit she is a relative. And the permissive use issue looks a little bit difficult too, since her apparently undisputed version is that she broke into the house at eight o'clock in the morning and took the keys to this car without the owner's knowledge. I'm trying to address those issues in, in the order that you presented them. And we also have testimony that the owner had previously screamed at her and said, don't use this car anymore. That's, that's absolutely true, and, Judge. And, and if I, since we're bouncing questions off you, from a prom, from a estoppel standpoint, I guess I'm having a hard time seeing how she was detrimented. Where, where the, because this is like a, a, a small insurance policy and, and I don't know what the, the carrier is supposed to do to help her in this situation. Apparently, this is a six and a half million dollar judgment apparently at the end. I'm sure with interest it's probably up around eight or nine. Okay. Um, I've got four questions pending. I'm trying. <laughs> I've got one too, but I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> Do your best. I'll try and hit them in order. The uh, my most I concede that the, my most difficult initial premise, although I don't think the record disposes of this case on a summary judgment basis, is the residency issue. Um, I also agree, especially based on the jury's finding in the underlying case, whether it has an estoppel effect or not. Uh, there's pretty, there's at least very good evidence in the record that relates to the fact that she didn't have permission at this initial in time. Now, the testimony in the initial underlying case, which was proffered as some of the summary judgment evidence in this case, I would respectfully submit all has to be taken with a large grain of salt. By the time this case gets moving at the trial level, the, the the driver changes her testimony somewhat substantially from her deposition in the underlying case to her trial testimony. Presumably the parties all become aware and understand that if she has permission, that could potentially and is more likely to make her uncle liable. So I guess my overarching th thought about the testimony in this case is notwithstanding the extent to which it might be she, she may have had economic reasons to give this testimony, even if it weren't true. Correct, yeah, and, that, and a that, jury has to sort yes. those issues out, even if the testimony is uniform, and even if you accept the testimony in the underlying case. When I took the owner's deposition in this case, now many years, admittedly, after the events, I asked him about where she was living at the time, and then he gave certain dates that actually favored our position. Then he kind of said, well, I don't really remember where she lived. And, one of the things we wanted to do was subpoena her McDonald's employment records to figure out where she told them she was living at the time of the accident. Apparently that didn't happen in the underlying case, which I wasn't involved in. So uh, relative to those issues, we think because they're all dependent on that testimony, which is necessarily and inherently self-centered and could have been, I guess what I'm really politely saying is people might have been lying to protect, she might have been lying to protect the uncle, and of course the uncle might have been lying to protect himself relative to those issues. But if the elements of estoppel are present. I don't know the answer to this, but it, was she charged criminally for any of this? She was, she was in jail and she was deported. I don't know, I believe charged, that's in the was record. Was she charged criminally for the accident or for the entry of the home? Is this, I mean, this is grand theft auto if you believe what's in the record. He never, no, actually he explicitly, in the owner explicitly indicated he didn't report her for the theft of the vehicle. That was actually asked of him, and he said, "But she probably got arrested then for a DUI homicide." She got. She was right. Like she that. had a the, the injury she caused to my client uh, rose to a level of criminality, and she was in jail. I think one of her depositions might have been taken in jail. Okay. Uh, so the the reason the estoppel matters is because it washes away all of those issues. The estoppel cases, Doe versus Allstate's an intentional act exclusion. The intentional act exclusion would have been definitively triggered by the facts of the case. Carrier didn't assert it. They were, at least it was a fact question after the Supreme Court's ruling about whether or not they were gonna be able to assert the defense. There's other cases cited in our brief, including one where the doctor is not even qualified as an insured, but the carrier starts to defend him. And the court says there's at least a question of fact about whether they're, they're stopped from denying coverage to somebody who couldn't even have qualified as an insured as an initial matter. So to the final question, which is what's the evidence of prejudice. The evidence of prejudice in this case is 
is a lack of settlement. There was a settlement demand in this case within policy limits that was made and the carrier attempted to negotiate it and for whatever reason they couldn't reach an accord about releases or whatever and that didn't happen. And there's also an affidavit from the plaintiff's counsel that we filed in opposition to the summary judgment motion that said if he'd been made aware of this issue that he would have reached some kind of an accord with the claimant that would have just limited the pursuit to the, any insurance rights. And there was an effort to settle this case. My impression is the policy limits of this is like a 1020 policy or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to be real candid. They tried to, they tried to give the carrier an opportunity to settle, perhaps with the hope that they might fail. But I mean, even if it's a setup, they, the, 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 re, the record reflects that they tried to. The record a, reflects the settlement offer of Mr. Shiner, who represented the claimants. A settlement for this, for the driver or for the owner? For both. Or for both? The settlement was for, would have settled for both. And with that background, Your Honor, the mere fact that that, by the way, she, it's undisputed they did not give her notice of that at the time. And with that background, at a minimum, there's potential prejudice. I mean, this wasn't an issue in our briefing, but there's cases in Florida that say prejudice doesn't have to be a mountain. Once I get a scintilla of prejudice, that's enough. And this record at least reflects some evidence, a scintilla of prejudice by virtue of the fact that they didn't settle the case, give her notice, an opportunity to settle the case. We argued another line of cases, which I guess to my way of thinking is kind of like a, I'll call them an estoppel light. They're not really strong on the analysis. It's an older case called Ging and another third district court of appeals case called Oser. Those cases essentially say, even if you don't have a duty as an initial matter, if you accept a duty in an insurance situation, you're bound to conduct the duty as though you properly were required to perform it. And really the entire concept of a reservation of rights is designed to allay that consideration, right? I mean, the whole purpose of a reservation of rights is you as the insurer are on notice that there might be a coverage defense and you want to tell the person that you're defending and taking care of, hey, we might not be on the hook for this. Well, that didn't happen until this case was way past any chance it could have settled and the case went to the horrific judgment that the court mentioned. I mean, obviously my client was very substantially injured. I want to go to another issue and maybe, maybe this is my, you're about 12 minutes in right now. My insurance nerd in me, Judge Alterman, you wrote at a dissent in a case called Allstate versus Wise. I don't know if you remember the case at all, but the case had to do with an intentional act exclusion, ironically, and whether it could be applied in an auto setting. And the majority ruled that the intentional act exclusion essentially violated the financial responsibility statute. You dissented essentially saying, well, this is a bodily injury liability case, so you can't, there's no mandatory bodily injury liability as required by Florida law, so they can contract for whatever limitations they want on bodily injury liability. But you noted if the case was a property damage case where coverage is mandatory, that the outcome might be different. That's also the facts of our case. This is both a bodily injury and a property damage case. We got a judgment for bodily injury and property damage. So to the extent that any of these exclusionary theories apply, our position is at least as to the property damage claim, because the coverage is mandatory, the carrier's exclusions can't override the public policy inherent in the financial responsibility statute and the requirement of property damage coverage. I don't have anything further to argue, and we would rely on our briefs unless the court, I think I got all the questions. If I didn't, I want to make sure I got them. Unless the court has any more questions, that's our position. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Mr. Ryder. Thank you.
Thank you. May it please the court. Jack Ryder appearing on behalf of the appellee Kingsway Amigo. And Mr. Ryder, before you get started, I'm going to comment to you that sometime about a day before Thanksgiving, we got a, this notice of correcting Scrivener's error in that Mr. Boyle hasn't picked on at all. But I got to tell you, your definition of Scrivener's error and mine are a tad apart. There, there, there's one thing in there might be a Scrivener's error. Everything else is a motion to amend your, your answer brief, which uh, if you'd asked Mr. Boyle, maybe he would have allowed you to amend your answer brief, but those aren't Scrivener's errors. That you're just trying to rewrite your brief. Well, so. I, I apologize for that, Your Honor. That's really more of a notice of correction of a miscite. In other words, that was simply to make clear that I was citing to, I wanted to make sure that I was citing to the appropriate transcript. And in my prior, uh, in the original initial, or my answer brief, the citation may have appeared misleading. So I wanted to correct that. Um, it, it doesn't change the, the substance scrivener, in any way, Your Honor. Not, it was a mistake by the writer, not by the scrivener. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. <laughs> and, if, and, if, and if the court uh, elects to disregard it, I understand, Your Honor. It doesn't in any way change the analysis. And of course, uh, Appley has filed a response to that, which I consented to, Your Honor. Your Honor. So, okay. I mean, uh, appellant, excuse me, filed a response. I have not seen the response. Yeah, they, he you. responded with my consent. So I apologize for that if there was any confusion. I'd like to go focus, Your Honor, first if I may, on the estoppel point, because that's where the appellant started. Uh, Your Honor, the concept here, to suggest that there's any estoppel here, uh, Your Honor, is completely unsupported by this record. First of all, the Doe case talks about the importance of the notion of expanding coverage by estoppel only in those rare circumstances where there can be a demonstration of prejudice. And as Judge Altenberg, you correctly pointed out, there has been no demonstration. There's been no serious assertion made of any type of prejudice whatsoever here. This notion, the notion, Your Honor, that what there was an attempt to settle. to settle with and maybe needing to tell her that you may not be insured and maybe you should try to figure out where $10,000 is to settle. Your Honor, not supported by the record. I would ask first that the court look at record 888, which is the reservation of rights letter that specifically mentions the fact that there have been attempts to settle the case that were unsuccessful. Um, and I would also ask the appellant to come before the court and identify where in the record there is any indication of this ex attempt this, to uh, support this assertion that there was the ability to settle the case within policy limits. That is not in the record. The affidavit of Mr. Bruce Shiner, which he referenced during his argument, is at record page 1158. And that doesn't say anything about an ability to settle this case within policy limits. I would ask that the appellant make good on his representation to the court that there is any support for that record assertion. It doesn't exist, Your Honors. There simply is no prejudice here, and none has been identified. In fact, to the contrary, Kingsway Amigo did the appropriate thing by providing a defense to a putative insured based upon allegations set forth in a complaint, which ultimately proved to be uh, untrue. The underlying lawsuit, the driver took the stand to the extent that there are any discrepancies that were related to the issue of whether she did or did not have permission to use the car, those discrepancies were heard before the jury in the underlying lawsuit. And the jury heard that, heard those, that testimony and reached a conclusion that the driver did not have either express or implied permission to use the vehicle. Well, but that was for purposes of dangerous instrumentality and li liability in tort, right? Your Honor, I think that here bears a distinction without a difference. To suggest in any way that the testimony here could support from the perspective of the analysis of an insurance coverage as opposed to whether or not the driver had permission to use the vehicle, I think would be a distinction without a difference. The testimony from the trial, we have testimony from the driver who testified she was never allowed to use the car. Uh, and we have, excuse me, we have testimony from both the driver and the owner. For example, the driver testified in the record at page 245. She did not have permission to use the vehicle at any time. At the record at page 266, she took the car without permission. At the record at page 273, never had permission to use the vehicle. Record at page 60, uh, 299, took the car when Mr. Delgado was not home because she did not want to be caught. If, at if you track her down in Mexico, somehow I'll take her deposition there and she says, well, that was a tort action and I was just trying to protect my uncle. I just lied. Well, Your Honor, first of well, all, the I mean, what happens if that, I mean, that it's not inconceivable, but what happens then? Well, Your Honor, the plaintiff 
had 31 months to make that happen. And let's be very clear about that. This lawsuit against Kingsway was filed two and a half years before summary judgment. And that's their primary argument, that they should have been given more opportunity to take discovery. Well, of course, in two and a half years, they never attempted to track down the driver. And, and I think it's critical here, Your Honor, that the underlying lawsuit was filed 10 years ago at a time when the driver was incarcerated. Now, they deposed the driver. And these questions were asked of her in her deposition. They were asked of her in front of a jury. And the jury reached the verdict that it did. Now, do, do if they know, do we know from this record, by the way, when she was I'm, I'm assuming she was released from prison, turned over to ICE and, and taken back to Mexico. That's what we know, Your Honor. Right? We know that that happened. We don't know when okay. uh, the record is not clear, but we do know that she was deposed at one point while incarcerated. We also know that she was brought to trial to testify in the underlying lawsuit. And we know that these questions were posed to her questions such as, did you have permission to take the vehicle? And they came at her every possible way. And she said over and over again, she stole the car. She used the word at one point, stole the car. So I think now to try and recreate, rewrite history, Your Honor, I believe that the appellant simply cannot do it. And to the extent that the appellant wanted to pursue the avenue now, they had two and a half years to either determine if she was still available or if she was in fact, if she had, you know, since she's gone away, um, they believe, and the record is unclear, but they assert that she's unavailable because she's in Mexico. Well, they could have subpoenaed appellant referenced the fact about wanting to pursue her, her um, employment records. They had two and a half years to do that because they knew since 2004 when the underlying lawsuit was filed where she was working. So, and that's of course their primary argument, this notion of discovery. And it simply is the case, Your Honors, that here they had every opportunity to do so and simply did not. Um, with respect to the issue also of the, the concept of permissive use, um, and one of their arguments is, and I, I touched upon this already, the notion that here there simply was no permissive use of the vehicle. Not only do we have the underlying testimony, and as I've stated in the record, uh, excuse me, in our brief, because she's unavailable, it is because she's unavailable that the court did appropriately consider that underlying testimony under 90.804. But the verdict, I believe, does have a preclusive impact under the Provident versus Genovese case. Now, I, I spoke a bit already about the estoppel argument, but because the plaintiff, the appellant, has made that their primary point before the court, I think it is important for the appellant to make good on their representation and to identify where in this record it is clear that this case could have been settled for within policy limits. I don't believe it exists, Your Honor, particularly, Your Honors, particularly when, as you, Judge Altenburn, you pointed out, this was a $6 million judgment on a $10,000 policy. The, lo the lawsuit, Underlying lawsuit was filed in circuit court for $15,000, in excess of $15,000. So I don't believe that there's any record support for it, and I believe it's not supported as a matter of law or logic. Now, moving on, Your Honor. Does the record reflect that there was any counteroffer by the plaintiff to the insurance company's offer? There was a lot, Your Honor, there was a lot of back and forth with respect to the, the car. There was back and forth with respect to the damage to the vehicle. and I. I'm getting the impression that that's where appellant wants the case to be, somehow suggesting that to the extent there could have been a settlement about the property, the vehicle, that that somehow would have resolved these cases, this case within policy limits. But I don't believe, Your Honor, that the record reflects the kind of back and forth suggesting that there was a settlement that was uh, accessible within policy limits. I don't see that there. It doesn't seem like the appellant's argument is a failure on the side of insurance hired counsel to advise the defendant that here, here's what the offer is, here's what they're counter-offering, you're gonna need to come up with some more cash to make this go away. I mean, they don't seem to go that far to say insurance counsel didn't provide enough. I mean, it seems like they say, well, the insurance counsel didn't tell her this particular settlement component, the initial settlement, and it seems like that's where it stopped. But Your Honor, the record, the record demonstrates, and again, I cite specifically to the record at page 888, because that is where the reservation of rights letter exists. There, and there is, by the way, back and forth, there's other correspondence in the record, but that letter specifically says to the driver, we have attempted to settle this case, but we're unable to do so. Invites the driver to the extent she was able to provide funds toward resolution. Maybe that wasn't something that 
was within the realm of real realistic possibility, but neither was settling this case for $10,000, Your Honors. And, and so the record, what we have in the record shows that a settlement efforts were made and communicated to the driver. The record reflects that. The fact that it didn't settle does not ipso facto somehow transform this case into a bad faith situation, but we're not even there. The bottom line is, is that this is about whether or not there was primary coverage over the driver. And they're trying to take the position, which I believe is totally unsupported by the Doe case, that somehow the providing of a defense but not settling it creates coverage by estoppel. That's not what Doe says. This is not a prejudice situation. Cases in Florida that have discussed prejudice creating estoppel are cases like the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust versus Village of Golf, uh, Golf and uh, Florida Physicians Insurance Company versus Stern, where there was either a delay in providing coverage um, or a delay in pursuing documents that then would have been used to absolve an individual, and that's prejudice, or a case, the other case where I mentioned, where uh, uh, there was a provision of, pol of insurance coverage given and then later taken away, and so the individual, the putative insurer, didn't have a chance to pursue additional policies that might have provided coverage. Neither of those scenarios exist here. This is completely distinct from those situations, Your Honors. Now, moving on to this issue of, of the residency, the concept of residency. Again, the concept of whether or not this is a covered individual rests upon whether they can demonstrate that she fell within the primary definition of what constitutes a covered person. And here, it is clear that the undisputed testimony that Ms. Uh, the, the driver never lived with the Delgados in the Golden Gate residence, the place where they were living for at least three or four months prior to the time she entered the house without permission, took the keys without permission, and took the car without permission, resulting in a car accident. Here, uh, Your Honors, and, and by the way, this court noted in Treza versus State Farm that when the facts are undisputed, whether or not somebody constitutes a resident of a household can be decided as a matter of law. And in, in State Farm versus Fisher, this court, Your Honor, in a, a, an opinion penned by Judge Silberman, said that the three-part test as to determining residency is close ties of kinship, a fixed dwelling unit, and enjoyment of all the living facilities. Now, it's interesting, in the reply brief, the appellant argues that State Farm versus Fisher supports their position. They take the position in their reply brief that this court reversed a finding of no coverage, but it's the opposite. In State Farm versus Fisher, this court reversed a finding of coverage and remanded because this court found that the definition of resident used in common parlance is not ambiguous. It's a clear and unambiguous term. And when we look at the facts here to determine whether or not Ms. Uh, the driver enjoyed the concept of a fixed dwelling unit or the living facilities, the undisputed testimony, again, undisputed, and this is for purposes of summary judgment, the driver did not move with the Delgados to their new home in Golden Gate because she was not welcome to live with them. Her wife, Mr. Delgado's wife, who, uh, Anna, 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 did not want her there. That's at the record at page 433. The driver never had keys to the Golden Gate home in the record at page 434. The driver did not leave belongings at the Golden Gate home at the record at page 434. Now, there's been some testimony that maybe she had one or two articles of clothing there. That doesn't change that doesn't give her the enjoyment of the dwelling. And in this lawsuit, in this lawsuit, and, and to be clear, Judge Alton Burns, and again, I apologize for that notice, I wanted to make clear that I wasn't overstating the testimony because it was in this lawsuit that Mr. Delgado was, was deposed again. And in this lawsuit, he said, in the record at page 1529, that the driver did not live with him at the time of the accident when he moved to the Golden Gate home. And what I did in my notice was I took out references suggesting more than that because I didn't want to overstate it, Your Honor. So to be very clear about that, again, I apologize, but to be clear, I was, I was if anything, I was reducing my, rely, I, I, was, I was limiting my argument, not expanding it. And that's why I wanted to make that point here. In this lawsuit, even if the court disregarded everything that happened in the underlying lawsuit, although I believe it is uh, binding under the concept of preclusion and binding under 90.804, in this lawsuit, Mr. Delgado testified in the record at page 1529 that the driver did not live with them in their Golden Gate home because his wife did not want her there. And that's three to four months prior to this accident. So, the, Your Honors, the, uh, 
Only, only other point I'll make. I believe that as a matter of law here, the driver does not fall within the definition of covered person. She did not have permission to use the vehicle. The verdict, I believe, locks that out, and the undisputed testimony locks that out. She also does not constitute a resident based upon the undisputed testimony that she never lived with the Delgados in their Golden Gate home. Um, but even if the court were to get beyond that, there was a policy exclusion that also applies. Because even if, even if the court found that all of those factors were disputed issues, the ex policy also excludes coverage for any person who uses a vehicle without a reasonable belief that the person is entitled to do so. The driver stood on the stand, took, sat on the, uh, on the stand, and testified before a jury that she stole the car. So clearly, she did not have a reasonable belief that she was entitled to use this vehicle. So even if the court got beyond the threshold issues that somehow put her into the category of a covered person, there's an exclusion that would have applied anyway here that precludes coverage. So un unless there are any questions from the court, I would ask that the court affirm entirely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boyle. First of all, I accept the invitation to deal with the record citation on the settlement overtures. Attached to Mr. Shiner's affidavit is a letter dated October 21st, 2004. On my version, it's on my tablet, the record numbers are 1179 through 1181. The, uh, I'll deal very briefly with the preclusion issue. Um, Preclusion in insurance is a complicated idea in some circumstances and not in others. But generally, it works like this. Where everybody's interests are aligned and exactly the same with respect to a fact, the easiest one is liability and damages. Both the insured and the insurer always want there to be low liability and low damages and no causation. Insurer and insurer travel together and they're all bound by those determinations. Where their interests aren't the same, relative to issues in the case, like intent, was, it, was it an intentional act, which might be excluded, whether it's a negligent act, which isn't excluded, the law doesn't apply a preclusive effect. The question of the permissive use here, obviously the, car the carrier and she, who was being defended by a lawyer hired by them, is necessarily in conflict, so there's no preclusive effect under the law of Florida. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the residency, and I talked to my a lot, a lot of those cases, though, deal with a party who wasn't a participant at trial, correct? Yeah, that's true, and the insurer and wasn't in on your, the verdict. Form. In your case, your client participated in the first trial. Your client had the ability to explore the issues that were determined by the jury fully, correct? Her liability was fixed irrespective of whether she had permission or not. So so you might have been able to object to that issue being determined by the jury? What I'm saying is she didn't, her interest, to the extent that she had any, wasn't really in that issue. That issue was the interest of the owner. He cared who had, whether she had permissive use. Her liability didn't get affected by that. And my point is she didn't necessarily have a dog in that fight. Whether she was a permissive user or not, she was liable. She was the driver. Um, relative to the residency issue, I talked to my associate this morning on the phone. We have a case, uh, we didn't file a notice of related cases, uh, but I, as I reviewed things this morning, we have a very, it's a case called Essenberg, where res residency is the issue. We just had oral argument with Judge Northcutt, Judge Kelly, and Judge Sleet. The case number is 2 d 13 Four four one four, and I'll be sure to give it in total detail to counsel. Uh, and uh, the issue of multiple residencies and the like, uh, that was the centerpiece of that oral argument. So to the extent the court's going to make any determinations on residency, you probably want to check with the judges on that panel. Unless the court has any further questions. Okay. Uh, I think the prejudice is established by the failure to settle. I think I set forth in the record just now the, the most blistering example of that prejudice. Uh, because of that, at a minimum on the estoppel grounds, this case should go forward. All right. Oh, uh, uh, counsel, counsel and I did speak about his notice of Scrivener's error. We had an interaction not unlike the one the court did 
as opposed to having motion practice, we professionally agreed to work it out. I take no uh, umbrage and in it, and, and that's I, why we filed I appreciate that. So. We didn't want to get the court bogged down. The court's going to take a, a break for about five minutes after this case and before we take up the next case on the docket, which is Howell versus Pasco County. But we have some students here in the audience that we talked to ahead of time, and so we'll give you a quick chance here. Do you have any more questions you'd like to ask of us or these two lawyers before they wander up the hall? Well, I can tell you that this is not a moot court, and so you don't win on speaker's points here. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I have a very hard time going and judging moot court competitions because I want to listen to the merits rather than figure out who does the best argument. Um, so but, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. And, and as to the first part, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes would remind us that it's a court of law, not a court of justice, and sometimes we write dissents because we don't agree with the law. <laughs> so, If you have uh, poor lawyering, 